Hello, I'm doing a book review and I'm joined by my friend Chris. Hi guys. Who is in my Exorcist review, uh, the review on the book The Exorcist. But we're here reviewing another classic 70s horror novel, and that's Carrie by Stephen King. Now, I actually have Carrie in this book right here. Uh, this is a collection of four of Stephen King's books put together into one. The other books contained in here are The Shining, Salem's Lot, and Night Shift. Now, Carrie was published in 1974, and this is King's first published novel. Now, he actually did write a few novels prior to this, but those weren't published till after this one. And he did write a few short stories before this that were published in different magazines, but he wasn't really making much money off those at the time. I actually think most most of what was later collected in Night Shift actually predates Carrie, but again, this is the one that really sort of... This is the book that really made Stephen King what he is now. Now, before this book was published, Stephen King was working as a school teacher. Him and his wife were living in this trailer, I think, and they, they spent a long time really kind of struggling to make ends meet, and this book really... Like, his whole story is almost like a rags-to-riches story, because... Mm -hmm. I think he sent this book out to get published, and he got a check back from whatever publisher originally published Carrie for, like, I think, four four $400,000, yeah. which to Stephen King at the time was pretty much a small fortune. Yeah. What was he, 26 when it first got published, I want to say? I think so, yeah. which is younger than me. Yeah, me too. Which is actually kind of... Sad when you really stop to think about it. Now, according to an interview I saw with Stephen King, this was originally going to be a short story, but he started expanding upon it, and he actually felt like it wasn't really going anywhere. So, according to the story he told, he just threw the manuscript out, thinking nothing was going to become of it, and apparently his wife Tabitha found it in the trash and fished it out and said, what the hell are you doing? Finish this. So, if that story is true... I guess we have Tabitha to thank yeah. for Stephen King's entire mm -hmm. career. I feel like Tabitha has done that with a lot of King's books, even Pet Cemetery. All right. I, no, uh, King didn't want to finish Pet Cemetery because he felt it was too frightening, too close to his own personal. But Tabitha was like, this is good, you have to finish this. Now, Stephen King actually based a lot of characteristics of Kerry White off of two girls that he went to high school with, one of whom was, like, mercilessly bullied at their high school. I'm not sure if you knew anything about that. Yeah, I heard about that. And also, the book in a lot of ways is sort of Stephen King's take on the Cinderella story. At least I've heard a lot of comparisons between this and the whole story of Cinderella. Like, it's a Cinderella story as told by Stephen King in a lot of ways. And the book also employs, even though it's not a vampire novel, you can see the influence of something like Bram Stoker's Dracula on this book, because the way Dracula was written, it was written in the form of, like, newspaper clippings and diary entries and letters sent back and forth between different characters, and Carrie's written in a very similar style. Yeah. All the news reports and everything, mm -hmm. how it starts out, yeah. Now, Chris, I know you're a big Stephen King fan, and yeah. what do you think of Carrie? I like Carrie. I mean, it's probably the, probably the fourth or fifth novel I read, I'm not really sure. But when I read it, I was thinking to myself that... You know, like, this girl, Carrie, she's basically a, an ordinary girl who's getting bullied. We all have that one person, I feel like, in middle school, high school, that always gets bullied, gets picked on. Like, myself, like, I remember uh, this kid being bullied in high school. And, like, in a way, I was kind of the Sue Snell of the story. Because, you know, I never made fun of him, but, like, always behind his back, I'd be like, yeah, what's up with this guy? But, you know, I would be nice to him in person and everything. I hate to say it, I think a lot of us might have a little Sue Snell in us. But Carrie, I think, is an amazing book. I think it's a... You know, for a first novel, it's really well done. And I really do love the writing style. Like, it goes back and forth between being sort of a normal novel, but then it cuts to, like, excerpts from books written about what Carrie did, and then, like, the letters and interviews and stuff. And I think it's a really fascinating writing style. Yeah, absolutely. God damn it, Cujo. <laughs> so, what the plot of Carrie is it's about a teenage girl named Carrie White who is constantly bullied by the other girls at her high school, and she's also abused by her mother, who is a unstable religious fanatic, and it turns out that Carrie has telekinetic powers, 
and ultimately she ends up using these powers to exact revenge on the bullies at her high school and on her abusive mother, but ultimately she ends up destroying her entire town with these powers, which I don't think is really a spoiler because no. they say that early on they in the do. book. So what do we think of the characters in Carrie? Alright, well, I'd like to talk about Sue Snell. I feel like with her character, I feel like she's the character that a lot of people feel like they are in high school. Like with Sue Snell, she was she was one of the popular girls. And although she was popular, but she was like, alright, why am I doing this? Why am I tormenting Carrie with these other girls? Like, what makes me do that? Like, she doesn't want to, she just feels like she has to fit in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like, in the beginning of the novel, we see Carrie and the girl's locker room taking a shower, and at 16, she has her first period. Now, normally, a girl would have their period a little younger than that. Yeah. But what really makes it strange is the fact that Carrie doesn't know what a period yeah. is, mm -hmm. because her mother never told her right. because of how religious, how psychotically mm -hmm. religious her mother is, yeah. and yeah, that's, when she has her period, she thinks mm -hmm. she's dying. She thinks she's bleeding to death. Yeah, yeah it's, mm -hmm. uh, and it's so sad, too, mm -hmm. like, it's just, mm -hmm. like, you feel so bad oh, for yeah. her, but so at the alone. same time, knowing that how teenagers think. Mm -hmm. I even wonder if I was one of these girls, how I would react to all okay. that, too. So, yeah. If I was one of the girls, I'd probably... I don't know if I would throw a tampon at her like all the other girls would have done. Plug it up! Plug yeah, it up! <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I definitely probably would have laughed a little bit. Probably would have left after a little while. Laughed behind her back, probably. But. Which, I, I, I'm sure there's some people watching this who would probably look at yeah. us like we're despicable human <laughs> beings. Yeah. We admit it's wrong, oh, you it's know? terrible. But <laughs> this is high school we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, with Sue Snow, you know, she did this, but like right after she did it, she felt terrible about it. And the uh, gym teacher, Miss uh, Dish Jordan, you know, she didn't know how to act either. She was a new teacher at the time. This was her first year. And she thought, you know, she was like telling Carrie to take care of herself. Because she thought, you know, she knew what to do. She didn't, so she just slapped Carrie across the face just to get over it. <laughs> yeah, definitely wouldn't get away with that these days. No, not at all. <laughs> I do want to talk a little bit about the character of Margaret White, who mm -hmm. in a lot of ways I do think is the true villain of the story. There is something kind of tragic about her as well. Like, I do think she's a very three-dimensional villain. Mm -hmm. Like, it doesn't really go too much into why she's this religious or and not that there's anything wrong with being religious but like the fact that she's a fanatic yeah. like because you find out that her mother and i think even her father were never really like that so mm. it never really goes into why exactly yeah. she's the way she is yeah. but there is something kind of tragic about her as well mm. i also i really did like <laughs> sue snell's boyfriend in the story yeah, yeah. tommy yeah. i thought he was a great character yeah. honestly <laughs> like he is kind of like like he's Sort of a jock, but you realize he's really intelligent, and I like how he kind of signifies what I personally believe, that all this, like, social status shit in high school means nothing in the real world, and right. he knows that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is why, while he's a little apprehensive about taking Carrie yeah. out to the prom at first, mm -hmm. he's willing to go with it. One, because he loves Sue, mm -hmm. but also, he feels bad for Carrie, too. The char character that I feel like it's talked about a lot more in the novel, is, um, uh, Chris's boyfriend, yeah, Bill, Billy Nolan. And with him, I feel like Billy has a really dark past that we, that we kind of get into, not really, though, about his parents, like, never being there. That's something Stephen King does a lot yeah. with, like, his bully characters, mm -hmm. is he does give them kind of sympathetic backstories mm -hmm. where you realize, okay, they're the victims of abuse yeah. and all that. If you want to say, like, who's another true villain, I would have to go with Billy Nolan. Because, I mean, like, he, he really didn't care about anybody, not even Chris Harkinson, his girlfriend, I feel. Because, like, he just wanted, he just wanted to do this for the fuck of it, pretty much. Yeah. And with Chris Harkinson, yeah, she wanted to get revenge for Carrie from that little prank that she pretty much started with the tampons. Um, Chris, Chris was, wasn't allowed to go to prom. And so basically she wanted to do the pig's blood for Carrie. Like, obviously bullying is a major mm -hmm. theme in the story, but also another theme in the story is religious fanaticism. And I feel like the book is kind of asking, how far do we go as a society in allowing certain 
things to happen because of religion. Now, obviously, you should respect other people's religious beliefs, but the book is kind of asking, how far does that go when you know there's blatant abuse happening right. in a household? Because you hear, like, stories that people tell about the relationship between Carrie and Margaret White in the novel, where you realize... The people, like, their neighbors kind of knew what something bad was going on, but they didn't intervene because they didn't want to come off like they were interfering with Margaret's religious beliefs. But it's like, if you know there's blatant abuse happening in a household, how far does that go in respecting a person's religious boundaries? You know what I mean? Basically thought her daughter, daughter was the spawn of Satan. And right when she was born, she was going to kill her. She didn't. And when Carrie was three years old, it's basically when she first showed her telekinetic powers by basically throwing stones right onto the house. Do get a lot of religious symbolism in the story, like when Carrie is destroying the town. Like, it's almost like she's the wrath of God coming down on this town in yeah. a lot of ways. Another part with the religion, like, when Carrie is bad, or so Margaret thinks Carrie's being bad, so she'll just throw her in her closet. And in this closet is all these, like, uh... All these Jesus statues, all these resurrections. And then paintings Jesus of, paintings. like, Judgment Day and yeah. stuff. Like, mm -hmm. it's it's so sad, yeah. like, what mm -hmm. this woman puts Carrie through. And I'm sure, I'm sure there's been cases, obviously not with the telekinesis shit, but I'm sure there's been cases of child abuse like that. Oh, yeah. Where somebody would lock them in a closet. Mm -hmm. And I hate to say it, I'm sure a lot, in a lot of those cases, religion probably does play a major factor in it. Yeah. And also, sexual repression is another theme you definitely see in the story, especially with Margaret. And I know Stephen King said that he felt the book was very much about feminism. Like, he saw Carrie's powers as being a symbol of her feminine strength coming out. And this was written right at the beginning of the whole women's lib mm -hmm. movement and all that. Yeah, that makes sense, because actually right after Carrie had her period is when her telekinetic powers started to come more alive. I even feel like once she started to know about them more, she was able to control it just a little bit more. Yeah. So. Now, to go back to the writing structure of the novel, how you get excerpts from books written about what Carrie did, you realize that in the universe of this novel, after what Carrie did, the world now knows that telekinesis exists. So you get a real sense that... Society is going to change now because of what Carrie did, or at least it's on the verge of changing. Like, there's even, because you get excerpts from a book that Sue Snell wrote years after the events of this story, where she even says the biggest mistake we could make is ignoring the possibility of another Carrie. Right. At least, I'm paraphrasing that, but she says something okay. along those lines. Yeah. So I like that, how even though it's sort of this small little story, you realize that the events of this story in the fictional universe of it are major events that have kind of affected the whole world, so you get all these hints of this much larger world. Mm -hmm. And if you want to talk about Stephen King's world in general, you, know, you have other novels such as The Firestarter, where this young girl Charlie has pyrokinesis, which is pretty similar, and they try to lock her up for it. Yeah. And also within, uh, let's just say, Stephen King's newest novel, The Institute, we have people, we have these kids who are TK, telekinesis, and these kids who are TP, telepathy, and basically they're kind of locked down for the good of the universe. <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, and you even get hints in this novel, like, hints about what kind of measures the government will take right. to right. prevent another mm -hmm. carry, like, will we start locking up kids with telekinesis, or so... put them down. Basically. Yeah, yeah, which... That, that's something where I'm kind of disappointed King never did an outright sequel to this novel, because I would have loved to have seen what became of the world of Carrie years later. Right. Now, usually in my Stephen King reviews, I try to point out any possible connections that the book might have with other Stephen King books, because for those of you who don't know, a lot of Stephen King's books take place in the same continuity. Like, a lot of them take place in the same universe, but if you tie it in with the Dark Tower series, you realize that there are multiple Stephen King universes. So, a lot of them might not be in the same exact universe, but definitely the same multiverse. Now, when it comes to Carrie, 
I kind of feel Carrie is separate from the mainstream Stephen King universe because, as we already pointed out, the events of this novel were major events that the entire world found out about. So if his later books are in the same universe as this, how come the events of this book are never actually mentioned in any of Stephen King's later books? Again, I do think Harry is connected, but I think it's set on sort of its own level of the tower, because okay. in the Dark Tower series they explain that different universes are called different levels of the mm -hmm. tower, so yeah. I consider Carrie to be on its own level of the tower as opposed to being on the same level of the tower that King's books like It or Pet Cemetery or The Dead mm -hmm. Zone mm -hmm. take place on. Yeah. Actually, in The Dead Zone there is technically a reference to Carrie, but it refers to Carrie as a book. Okay. And if, of course, if you read the Dark Tower series, Series, you would find out that it is possible for something to be a fictional story in one universe, but be a reality in another universe, especially with a certain character you meet in the final three Dark Tower books. Yeah. Well, I feel there are definitely certain themes in Carrie that are taken throughout Stephen King's universe. Say, um, The Shining, for instance. Oh, yeah. Now, yeah. whether... Carrie actually has the shine or not, I'm not too sure, because I feel like the telekinetic powers could be different than that, but I do feel maybe Sue Snell had some of the shine, because I feel like she was able to connect with Carrie, who was able to read her mind in some ways, and when, well, at the end of the novel, something big happens, and I feel Sue Snell was, knew right away that it was Carrie who did it. Yeah. And it was also, let's see, I mean, this is a little connection, with, uh, I think, Sue Snell's mother driving a 1977 Plymouth. Yeah, so, but that, that could know. mean anything, could mean you know? Anything. I don't yeah. think that's literally supposed to be Christine. No, I don't think that is Christine, but I think that could be a reference to, like, maybe something later that King wanted to do. I do like to think of Carrie as being part of the multiverse, just right. not the mainstream universe. Okay. But there is actually a reference to Carrie in the mm -hmm. final Dark Tower novel, where the character of Dinky Earnshaw uh -huh. makes a reference. He says something about, do you know what it's like to be, like, Carrie at the prom? Oh. Granted... Now, that could mean could he's from the same different. universe that Carrie is from, or maybe in his universe, Carrie That's is true. just a story. True. Yeah, what do you think of that? Do you think he could be from the same level of the tower as Carrie? I mean, from reading that passage, I would say he was thinking more fictional. Yeah. But you never know. Carrie mentioned that she had a dream that her mother was fighting the black man. But with the black man, I was thinking maybe, possibly, the man in black. Yeah, Randall, Randall Flagg, Flag. yeah, from The Stand mm -hmm. and the Dark Towers yeah. series. What do you feel about that? It's possible. I, I think that was probably just a dream or hallucination, okay. but... Yeah. I mean, if you tie it all in with the Dark mm -hmm. Tower, you're kind of supposed to assume that Randall Flagg and the Crimson King are kind yeah. of responsible for mm -hmm. all these events that happen throughout the multiverse. Right. So maybe, maybe that was implying mm -hmm. that Randall Flagg or the Crimson King were pulling the strings here. Okay. If you want to interpret it that way. Yeah. One other thing is, um, if you think about, like, all the beams that hold up the Dark Tower, yeah. like, I was wondering, could Carrie single-handedly just take down one of the beams herself? Yeah, that's actually, I do think it was a missed opportunity mm. not to bring Carrie back in the Dark yeah. Tower series. Now, you might be wondering if you've read the book, uh, how would King bring her back? But a big part of the Dark Tower mythology is sometimes if a person dies in one world, they could come back in Midworld, mm -hmm. which is the main setting of the Dark Tower series. And I think Stephen King could have found a way to bring Carrie back for that yeah. series because it would have been so appropriate. Carrie is Stephen King's first novel, and right. Dark Tower is meant to be the culmination of everything he's ever yeah. written. If he did bring Carrie back in, like, the final three Dark Tower books, yeah. what do you think her role would have been? Do you think she would have been an ally or an enemy to the Quartet? Well, I feel like she probably would have been more of an enemy, actually. Hmm. Yeah, because I feel like... I feel like, uh, Randall Flagg would have just probably taken her and probably just used them against her. Like, I don't think Carrie would have even really been able to understand what was going on. Like, I feel like Randall Flagg would have just been, like, a puppeteer just using her against them. What you said really makes me wish King did that yeah. now. I mean, I love the final three Dark Tower oh. books. I just think there were a lot of missed opportunities. Okay. Now, another possible connection with another Stephen King property. Stephen King did a mini series called Rose Red, and... 
There is a character named Annie who has the same powers as Carrie, and at the end of this book, they do allude to a character named Annie. Could it be the same character? Or, again, if you want to tie it in with Dark Tower, maybe an ult maybe the Annie from Rose Red is mm -hmm. an alternate universe version of the Annie that's mentioned at the end of this book. One other fan theory that I actually had was, with Firestarter, you have the dead, who had this girl, Charlie, who has, well, pyrokinesis. Now, we talk, you know, and Carrie, there's talk about the dead a little bit, but we don't know too much about him. I'm thinking... Could he be the same dead? <laughs> Probably not, but... Well, it does mention a... that Carrie's father died, right? It did, but did he really? We don't really know. <laughs> because Margaret could have just been saying that, just to yeah. protect Carrie. And I feel like, all right, maybe he ran away from Carrie, he had sex with some other woman, had this girl Charlie, and actually wanted to do right by her this time. So, any final thoughts on Carrie, the book? Um, I think it's a great book overall. I definitely give it a read. Yeah, it, I think it's one of King's... In my personal opinion, this is one of my top five favorite Stephen King mm -hmm. novels. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. it is one of his best books, in my opinion. Yeah. Now I want to play it. <laughs> Damn it, Cujo! <laughs> <laughs> now I want to play a series of short reviews that different friends of mine have done on this book. When it comes back to us, we'll be talking about the 1976 film adaptation of Carrie. Hello. My friend Christian has asked me to do a short review on the Stephen King novel, Carrie. Um, this was, of course, Stephen King's first published novel back in the year 1974, uh, which was also the year I was born, so Carrie and I, same age. Um, it wasn't the first Stephen King novel I read. I actually had read a lot of Stephen King novels before I went back and read Carrie. Um, and my opinion of Carrie is that it is a solid, if uh, awkward, novel. Um, you can definitely tell it's a first novel by a young writer. Um, it's not as polished. It doesn't flow as smoothly as some of his later work. But the story in it is a wonderful story. Um, with the character of Carrie, he's created sort of a tragic villain. Because she is someone you feel for. Um, and she is someone, especially near the end, that you start to root for and want to see good things happen for her. And then, of course, as we all know, everything just goes to hell in a handbasket. Um, and it's quite a tragic end for um, almost everyone involved. Um, and you don't condone what Carrie has done, but because you have sort of lived her life leading up to that moment, you understand it. Um, which leads to the tragic element of her character. Um, I actually wrote an article, a nonfiction article about, um, Carrie once, um, in which I suggested it has a lot to say about bullying, which is still very relevant today, um, and it also, in some ways, parallels the school shooter phenomenon, which has become, unfortunately, all too familiar to us, um, because if you replace her telekinesis with a gun, you have a classic setup for a tragic school shooting. So, in that way, the book is still extremely relevant all these um, many decades later. I don't really like to talk about how many decades since I am the same age as the book, but um, that keeps it very relevant. And I think even though there are some flaws to it, like I said, it doesn't flow very smoothly, there's still great writing in here. You can tell that it is a great story writer who's telling you this story. So, I definitely still recommend Carrie. I still think it's a relevant read, and that's my review. Like most fans of Stephen King, I have a top 10 list of favorite Stephen King books. However, Carrie is in my top 5, so I don't even know why I brought that up, to be honest. But, uh, you know, Carrie, and, and when I say top 5, it's not that, you know, any of them are in order. Even my top 10, really. None of them are in order, it's just these are the books that I love most of all. It's not like, you know, it is number one, the stand is number two, anything like that. It's just that these are the, the top five books that I love the, the best. You know, these are the ones that I can reread over and over again, which I have. These are the books that I always gravitate to. Um, I love them to death. I've read them several times since I was a kid. You know, the, some of these are even the first books I've read by Stephen King. And um, Carrie is definitely just one of the best books you can ever find. 
it's a really short book, so it's, you know, it's, it's a really quick read also, if you're just looking for something quick to read, but, um, you know, in that short amount of time, it really is a lot of fun. I love the way it's written, I love how it's written kind of Frankenstein-ish, where, you know, you do have documents and stuff like that, but it does have a third-person narrative, it's just that there are documents, newspaper clippings, uh, excerpts from textbooks and stuff like that, uh, which, which makes the book, you know, really, really fun and really realistic. It does make it more believable as, you know, as unrealistic as psychic powers are. Um, it really is cool to see that you do have a, a sense of believability in there. There's something that really makes you feel like this could have happened. And, and, um, you know, it, it's just a really good book. I love Carrie, the character. She's a very sympathetic character. She's, uh, you know, you just feel so bad for her for the things she goes to. And of course, you know, if you've been bullied as a kid, you know what she goes to because she has to deal with bullies. And, and you know, you, you can really relate to her. And, um, you know, you can really see how, how what happens in the book, I won't spoil anything, but you can see where it leads to, you can see how she got to that point of just kind of being driven over the edge to pretty much insanity, and, um, you know, the bullies even have, uh, good character development, you kind of see why they're so evil, uh, especially her main bully, which I always forget her name, is it Christine, something like that, anyway, whatever it is, her main, um, bully, the one that really messes with her, when you get to meet her father, for example, you get to see why she's such a spoiled, entitled brat, and then, of course, you get into Sue Snell, and she's more on the good side, and, and you like how she kind of plays that part, and then, of course, the boyfriend, but he's not a bully, it's just that you get to see these characters, you get to see why they are the way they are, and I love that. Stephen King is always very good, very good when it comes to character development. He's very good at making villains, and he's very good at making good characters, he's very good at making, uh, you know, very fleshed out characters to the point where, you know, they have good sides and bad sides to them, even Carrie, you know, she's very good, but there are things that obviously happen in the book that you can't, um, you know, you can't approve of, you know, if you're looking at a legal standpoint, but... Uh, you know, you feel for it, and you can understand why it happens, and I love that, you know, the book is written very, very well, it's one of Stephen King's first books, but it's written, you know, like a veteran wrote it, it's fantastic, um, which makes sense, because he wrote a lot of, you know, short stories and stuff before that, but still, um, I'm so glad that this didn't end up in a trash, the way he talks about it, you know, saying that he was gonna throw it away, and then his wife took it out and stuff, I'm glad that didn't happen, because, it is a fantastic book. It's it's one of his greatest, and uh, hopefully it'll last forever, and people will still read it. I know kids tend to read it, and I do recommend it for um, a younger audience, because especially if you like the teen genre, um, you probably will like this a lot more, because um, this kind of fits into that category, but even adults can like it. I mean, it's a great horror story. It does have some creepy scenes in it. Uh, the mother, a very creepy, very disturbing person, Carrie's mother. Um, she's one of those people like the lady in the mist that's just really annoying with their religious beliefs, just really, really annoying. And, um, I mean, it just drives you crazy and you don't understand how anybody can be like this, but at the same time, you kind of do see that there are people like that. So she's realistic too. And yeah, this is a great book, very quick paced, um, very suspenseful, very good. Like I said, sympathetic. Um, draws you in, makes you feel a lot of different emotions, happiness, sadness, anger, um, and yeah, I just love this book, Carrie is a fantastic, fantastic novel, and I recommend it to everybody who, uh, is a fan of Stephen King, and anybody who's interested in Stephen King, or the teen genre, or anything that has to do with horror, and, um, yeah, so thank you so much, bye-bye. So here we are at the beginning, um... I love that <laughs> the guy's career starts off so simply with a very short book that's kind of totally different from the thousand page epic tomes he's going to end up writing later in his career and being known for. But um, I, I guess that's what I appreciate the most about Carrie is just the simplicity of it. Um, 
Right out of the gate, you kind of have him sort of doing a challenge as a writer, which is, can this guy write for women? And he can in his own unique way because it's just a very sheltered, very kind of out of touch with the world girl who ends up building a lot of rage when she realizes just how much has kind of been stolen from her and how um, marginalized she's been by her own mother and by the school she goes to and and the kids that surround her. She's very isolated, even though she kind of wanders through life between all these people. Um, I just love the central conceit of a girl realizing she has psychic powers and everything kind of just letting rip um, because nobody was smart enough to realize that this is not how you treat people. Uh, her mother should have had a better idea of how to raise a kid. The people around her should have had a better concept of how to treat somebody who's kind of an outsider and doesn't really know how to function as an adult because this is a girl who's so sheltered, she didn't understand what it was to menstruate. And, you know, even as a dude watching that scene, you feel so bad because she, she thinks she's dying, And nobody empathizes with her. Nobody gets that she's a weirdo because she comes from a strange household and they just start pelting her with um, sanitary napkins and all this horrible shit. And uh, it makes sense. You know, it's, it's just naturally where the story is headed when you watch it in retrospect because it's like, of course, she's gonna get pissed that there's just no empathy around her. And, uh... Everybody just has their head too far up their ass to appreciate that she is a very isolated person who has not been taught what she should have been taught. Um, I love the structure of it, uh, the epistolary, kind of the opening with the letter, closing with the letter. It's kind of a cool, like, full circle way to do a novel. Um, as for connections to, like, the larger King verse, there's certain things uh, I think the last chapter mentions a girl named Annie I don't know how many people have picked up on this but I think Annie Annie has the same powers as Carrie is uh, kind of the way that we leave off the ending so something like this might happen again or somebody with power similar to her might still be around but I'm pretty sure the Annie that they're talking about is supposed to be the Annie from Rose Red the TV miniseries because she does have very similar powers to her in that uh, in that show. And I think the whole thing with the stones dropping on the house is something very similar to what Carrie would do. Um, yeah, I think I just appreciate the simplicity of it, really. Because it's not trying to be anything more than it is. It's not sort of... Um, what would the word be? Uh... It's not ambitious. It's just, let's tell a story about rage and about being isolated and see where it goes. Um, basically, we're going to do like sort of a high school drama with like a horror fantasy bent. And um, for the stuff that he got known for, it's kind of, it makes sense, but it's also out of left field at the same time. Because his stuff is always about the mendacity of real life kind of put up against how fucking crazy, horrific situations can get. And, you know, people with crazy powers and people with horrible, sadistic impulses. But this is the only one where it's sort of an adolescent type thing. Um, Or at least one of the few where it's an adolescent sort of story. Uh, I guess it would be another example. And uh, some of the short stories that I've read, like Cain Rose Up and um, you know, Rage, the, uh, the first Bachman book. So I guess the early stuff kind of has that similar thread of, uh, of a lot of pent-up aggression that if somebody doesn't know how to facilitate, they're going to just snap and overdo it and end up inevitably killing a lot of people. So that's kind of almost like a fascinating psychological study at the same time. Um, Yeah, there's a lot of really different things you can get out of it. And 
given the simplicity that I was talking about, it's it's cool to see that you can take it as like, okay, this is a story about somebody with telekinesis. This is a story about fanatical religion. It's a high school drama. It's yeah, like a revenge story. It's it's all these different things, but it's it's a relatively straightforward story at the same time. Um, so right out of the gate, you get a sense of just how much Steven can do with the story and how well he can write a plot and characters and dialogue and all these things. So for the launch of this big multiverse that we're all such a big fan of and so enamored with, this is a, a very cool and in retrospect, actually kind of unconventional start. And uh, obviously we owe a lot to it because this is what got the ball rolling. And we're back, and now we're talking about the 1976 film adaptation of Carrie, which was directed by Brian De Palma. Now, this was not Brian De Palma's first movie, but it was definitely the movie that kind of shot him into the mainstream. I think the movie is excellent. I think it's a very good adaptation. It does change a lot from the book. Like, it drops the whole thing of Carrie destroying the entire town. Instead, it seems like she just destroys the prom and all that. Yeah. But I think the changes make sense. One, for budgetary reasons. And also, that whole thing of her destroying the town. It works really well in a book, but maybe for a movie it would have been a little over the top. Yeah. But what do you think of the movie? Uh, I like the movie a lot. Um, I thought... The person who played Margaret White did an excellent job. Piper Laurie? Piper Laurie. Yeah. I feel like she did an excellent job as the mother. Like, it always kind of, like, creeps me out to watch her. Yeah, like, you know what's funny is she actually thought the script was a comedy. Okay. Yeah, she did not like the script, and then somebody told her, oh, no, no, it's a satire. And that's why her per performance is so over the top, because she thought she was supposed to be playing it as a comedy. But I think Sissy Spacek was amazing oh, as Carrie absolutely. White. Absolutely. But what do you think of, like, Amy Irving as uh, Sue Snell in the movie? I thought she did a great job. What do you think of John Travolta in the movie? <laughs> All right, well, I want to say, well, with Billy and the person who played Tommy, I felt like, I felt they probably thought it was a bit of a comedy, too. All <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, what, that was John Travolta's first role, right, if I'm not mistaken? Technically, it was his first starring role. Okay. He did have a small appearance in a movie called The Devil's Reign, okay. which came out the year before. Okay. You know, with that, you, you know... With their roles, I don't feel you get, like, all right, what of these characters, you know? I don't feel like you get the entire backstory of these characters. But, you know, I guess it's not really needed for the movie. There is actually some comedy in the movie. Like, yeah. there's a scene where where Tommy and a few of the other guys are going out to get, like, tuxedos oh, for yeah. the prom. And, <laughs> like, it starts That's playing the bad. film <laughs> in, like, uh, fast-forward motions. Yeah, yeah. Like... Okay, like, there are moments in the film that are clearly meant to be cheesy, funny, yeah. but then you have really horrific moments in the film and moments of real hardcore drama. Yeah. Like, all the stuff dealing with Carrie White and her mm -hmm. mother are so powerful in that movie. And actually, mm -hmm. Sissy Spacek and Piper Laurie were both nominated for mm -hmm. Oscars for their performances in the movie. Yeah. But yeah, it's a great film. It yeah. really is. Mm -hmm. And I think it did a lot for Stephen King because at the time Carrie was published... I think it sold well, but I don't think it was, like, a huge bestseller. The movie Carrie definitely, like, yeah. that really is one of the things I think helped make Stephen King a household name. Yeah. And then in 1999, you had a sequel to the 1976 version of Carrie called The Rage, <laughs> Carrie 2. Now, I remember seeing it as a little kid, and I, of course as a little kid, you like, you'll probably like anything. Uh, then I... Saw it years later, and I was like, eh, this sucks. I recently rewatched it, and you know what? It's not terrible. It's not a terrible movie. Was a, se was a movie sequel to Carrie necessary? Absolutely not, but it wasn't terrible. Uh, what do you think of Carrie 2? I mean, I only saw it once years back. From from what I remember, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't terrible. It wasn't the best, but... I felt, I remember there being one scene at the end that actually, like, kind of spooked me. I was like, oh, shit. All right. Like, there was uh, the part where I think she sees, like, the ghost in the mirror or something. And it just shatters, I think. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. That's uh, where her boyfriend mm -hmm. sees her ghost at the end. Yeah. But, yeah, it's, it's not terrible. It's no. not a great movie. But, mm -hmm. you know what? There are way worse 
sequels to movies based on Stephen mm -hmm. King books. Yeah. It's not as bad as, like, the Children of the Corn sequels oh, yeah. or something. <laughs> and then in 2002, there was another adaptation mm -hmm. of Carrie. I've only seen parts of that one, but you've mm -hmm. seen that one, right? I've seen it, yeah. It's like a complete TV adaption. And I don't really like it, but I will say there are some parts that they focus more on the novel. So... Like, one of those parts being, when Carrie was young, she ran into one of her neighbors, and she was like, oh, what's that? I'm like, oh, these are my breasts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, so the movie does do the do whole stone set. scene. Yeah, they do. Mm -hmm. I don't really remember how the mother did, to be honest, because I'm trying to pluck that movie out of my mind. But <laughs> Carrie herself, eh, she's alright, but I feel... Even, like, the last scene, she lives at the end of this movie adaption. Well, I heard that the reason they did that was they actually wanted to do a Carrie TV series, and okay. this was actually basically meant as the pilot for the series. Okay. But, of course, you know, that didn't work out. No. <laughs> what do you think of the 2013 adaptation? Because I actually okay. haven't seen that well, one yet. All right. Well, I thought it was a pretty good adaption, and, uh, was it Juliana Moore, who played uh, Margaret White? Mm -hmm. I thought she did a fantastic job, actually. And I felt what she did, what Piper Laurie did not do, I felt like she added a lot more pain to herself. Like, you can see, like, during the movie, when she was feeling stressed out about Carrie and stuff, like, she would just, like, cut the back of her legs. Yeah. Just, like, rip, actually rip her hair out. Mm -hmm. Like, I thought she did a great job. Um, Chloe Grace... Moretz. Like, yeah. I thought she did a pretty good Carrie. Like, I felt she was trying a little too hard, but, like, the telekinetic abilities. I thought she was like trying to really like show it off with like her hands and stuff. But like, see something in the, something in uh, the book and the new edition of the movie, which they didn't really focus on on the 1976 adaption, was that um, Sue Snow was pregnant. And they mentioned it a little bit in the book, not too much, but in the movie, at the very end, like, she Carrie throughout her destruction, she actually saves Sue Snow. She like pushes her out of the way and she's like, you're pregnant. <laughs> so, I felt like, sh in the new version, she was more uh, compassionate to, like, some people. Like, yeah. And she really wanted to save Sue because she knew she was trying to help her. Yeah, whereas in the novel mm -hmm. and in the 1976 yeah. version, she was like, oh, you die! <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I don't know if that was a good thing or a bad thing, but... <laughs> have you ever seen the Carrie musical? I have not. Neither have I. <laughs> now... I heard they're going to be doing, like, a miniseries based on Carrie. I don't know if you've heard mm -hmm. about that or not. Heard a little bit about it. I don't know if it will... Because Carrie's yeah. such a short novel, but yeah. there are things that you could definitely expand upon to make it a miniseries. Mm -hmm. One thing that I think they should do is make it, like, a mockumentary or something. Because okay. that would add to, like, the whole thing from the book of mm -hmm. them jump into, like, the newspaper clippings and the interviews and the excerpts from books mm -hmm. written about what Carrie did. Like, they could do that, like, in a documentary form. Make it almost like a found footage movie. I think okay. that might work. Could be interesting. I don't um, know if it would work, technically, because I just feel like Carrie, it's already been overdone. I yeah. feel like them making a TV show out of it, or just, I don't think it would work. Because okay. if you look at other Stephen King adaptions, such as The Mist, they did a TV show off of The Mist, and I felt it was so, it was okay, but I just feel like the TV show just, like, it wasn't needed. Now, with Carrie, both the book and the 1976 film had a pretty big influence on pop culture, like... I, a few years after Carrie, there was a film called Jennifer the Snake Goddess that was pretty much a ripoff of Carrie. Uh, also, Brian De Palma did a film called The Fury, which I know was based on a book by another author, but it's so clear when Brian De Palma made that, he was trying to sort of recapture the magic of Carrie, because that's also a story that deals with telekinesis. Mm -hmm. And then, I don't know if you've ever seen Friday the 13th Part 7, The yeah. New Blood, mm -hmm. where Jason fights the character of Tina Shepard, who yeah. has telekinetic powers, yeah. and it, it's so clear when they did that movie, they were basically making Carrie versus <laughs> Jason. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of Friday the 13th mm -hmm. Part 7? I like it, I mean... Because it, it was different from the other Friday the 13th. You actually had someone with who could actually fight off Jason without 
with something new. Yeah. Like some other kind of power. Speaking of Friday the 13th, even the first Friday the 13th movie was loosely inspired by not so much the book, but the movie Carrie, because in the movie Carrie, there's the scene where Sue Snell goes to Carrie's grave, and this is just a dream sequence, uh -oh. and Carrie's hand comes out of the ground and grabs her arm. That actually inspired Tom Savini oh. to come up with the whole thing at the end of Friday the 13th, where the ghost of Jason yeah. Voorhees comes out of the water and pulls Alice into the yeah. off of the canoe into the lake. Mm -hmm. There was a manga series called Akira by Katsuhiro Otomo. I'm not sure if I'm saying his name right. Uh, it's an excellent series, but the main villain of that series is this kid named Tesuo who has telekinetic powers. And I feel like Harry definitely had an influence on that manga series, particularly with the character of Tesuo. Okay. But I don't know if you've ever read that. No, I haven't. Yeah, it's a really good series. It was also made into a 1988 anime film called Akira. Okay. There's also... Have you ever saw the movie Chronicle? No, I haven't heard of it. Yeah, Chronicle's a really good one, and I think Chronicle also owes a lot to Carrie. Like, mm -hmm. the main villain of Chronicle is a very similar character to Carrie White in a lot okay. of ways. And then even the character of Eleven on Stranger mm -hmm. Things, okay. you could tell, was definitely yeah. influenced by mm -hmm. Carrie. I mean, yeah. even though Stephen King didn't write Stranger Things, mm -hmm. his fingerprints are all, all over that all series over. Yeah. in a lot of ways. Even the title itself is very similar to Needful Things. Yeah, novels, so. and even the font of Stranger Things mm -hmm. was specifically done to look like the font of a lot of King's novels yeah. in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And then you wanted to bring this show up. There's oh, yeah. uh, So there's this new show on Netflix called I Am Not Okay With This, who features uh, the, girl from, the girl from It, Beverly. And basically she plays a 17-year-old girl who's, who starts to realize she has telekinetic powers. And, you know, basically it's... I think it's like a cross between Carrie, The Breakfast Club, and this other show on Netflix called um, End of the Fucking World. I don't know if you ever saw that. No, I haven't seen okay. that one. But, like, pretty much if you put it all together, that's what the show is. And basically, you know, she learns about these telekinetic powers, and she can really, she starts to really only be able to use them when she's really upset or angry about something. And then her friend, like, helps her, like, basically trains her to actually start to use them, like, get control of it. And I'm not, I won't give too much away, but it's a short series if you want to watch it. And at the end of it, you know, there's like a homecoming dance and won't give away anything else. But You can even see the influence of Terry in some of Stephen King's son, Joe Hill's work, mm -hmm. like uh, Lock and Key, like yeah. the final volume of Lock and Key. Mm -hmm has a lot of callbacks to Carrie. There's a scene in the final Lock and Key graphic novel mm -hmm. where Jamal and uh, the character of Scott, Scott basically yeah. reenact the uh, mm -hmm. prom scene from Carrie with yeah. the pig's blood mm -hmm. and all that. And then even the whole idea of a tragedy happening on prom night, mm -hmm. you could definitely see that in Lock and Key. Yeah. So that was our review on Carrie by Stephen King. And long days and pleasant nights <laughs> to you. Have a good night, everybody.